chapter 42. George McNabb was the first to speak up. He was stretched out on the only new piece of furniture in the house, a tilt back lounge chair. Said McNabb, what's he doing here? The awkward silence of follow was mercifully broken by Piper tugging on Maniac's arm. Where's my birthday present? What'd you get me? Maniac pulled the present from his pocket. Piper exclaimed, a watch. No, said Maniac, a compass. It tells you which direction you're going. Like to the ocean? Asked Russell. The ocean, Mexico, anywhere in the world. Only one thing. What's that? Maniac took the compass from Piper's hand. I'm keeping it till school's over. If you go every day, both of you, then you can have it back and sail around the world. On a raft? Piper cheered. Is it a deal? Piper and Russell and Maniac did a three-way high five. It's a deal. George McNabb pulled himself up from the easy chair and shuffled into the kitchen. He wore bare back slippers over bare feet. His white ankles were dirty. He took a beer can from the fridge and headed for the steps. Let me know when it leaves, he said and went upstairs. Maniac could feel the voltage that surged through Mars bar and crackled black lightning from his eyes. Quickly, he clapped his hand. Hey, isn't this a party? Where are the games? So they played games, silly games whose main object seemed to be shrieking and screaming. Mars Bar allowed himself to be dragged into them, but his jaw was clenched and his eyes kept straying to the gaping hole in the ceiling and to the cobras who were slouching against the walls and baseboards, slip, sipping beers and watching his every move. None of them had spoken since Mars and Maniac walked in. Of course, as far as the little kids were concerned, the highlight of the whole party was not the birthday boy, Piper McNabb, but the McNabb's new pillbox. They found every excuse to stay inside it. They fought over space at the narrow guttery slots when Mars Bar whispered to Maniac, what is that? Maniac said it was a bomb shelter. Then Russell called, let's play Rebels. White's in the pillbox, black's outside. A cheer went up and a dozen kids stampeded into the pillbox. Their gavel circled the cinder block walls and popped from the gunnery slots. I'm gonna be white, I'm white, me too. Too many in here, we need more blacks. Not me, not me. We ain't got enough guns, only the ones with the guns are in. Theresiak, get out, you're black. Give me a gun, I had it first. Come on, you meatballs, blacks is the best part, you have to charge. Yeah, we get to lose. Look, you can use beer cans for grenades. You just lob grenades. Then you do it. Well, somebody gotta be black, else we ain't playing. I'm counting, I hit 10. I wanna see five of you out of here. One, Russell counted. No one came out. Not at nine, not at 10, not after 10. Maniac and Mars Bar stared in silence at the gunnery slots. Their wide open eyes began to appear one pair top another. The three words that Mars Bar sneered, the joke that he spat out, yeah, bomb shelter, to not even have the, not even have the moment in the cells. For just then, another word, Geronimo, came plunging from the sky and landed with a floor-jarring, heart-stopping crash directly behind him. A cobra had jumped from the hole, a fat, red-haired cobra who's now rolling on the floor and laughing so hard, as were all the cobras, that his face matched the color of his hair. You see him? You see him jump? I never seen, I never, see his face? Somebody check his, somebody check his pants, check his drawers. Oh man, oh. Maniac had to wrap Mars Bar in a bear hug to keep him from charging the fat red roller. The laughter stopped as if cut by scissors. The cobras were standing. John McNabb sauntered forward. You got a problem, Sonny? That wasn't funny, John, it's a maniac. He could have been hurt. McNabb kept his eyes on Mars Bar. I ain't talking to you, McGee. I'm talking to Sonny here. Don't you like our party, Sonny boy? Mars Bar strained against Maniac's arms. You ain't gotta worry about me coming to no more of your parties, fish belly. You ain't gotta worry about me invading this piss hole. Anybody come to a block anyway, they faint from the smell. Maniac McNabb advanced. Maniac shouted, John, you owe me one. I brought the boys back. McNabb took another step, then stayed. The Cobra stayed. The maniac clamping the struggling Mars bar for dear life, lugged him down a gauntlet of seething eyes to the door and the street. Mars bar wrenched free and stomped on ahead. 
Maniac followed. It was almost dark. High above, the street lights were buzzing on one by one. After several blocks, Mars Bar wheeled. You sucker me. You soft me up with them pick peoples and then bring me here. What do you think? I was going to cry? Okay, I come over. I did it. It's done. And don't you be coming around no more. You hear me, fish? Because you ain't only seen me half bad yet. He turned and headed due east. Maniac walked another way. It was a good question. What had he thought? What had he expected? A miracle? Well, come to think of it, maybe one had happened. While he was looking for one miracle, maybe another one stuck up on him. It happened as he was clamping and lugging Mars Bar down the gauntlet of cobras, trying to keep him alive. And what was Mars Bar doing? Fighting him? Maniac? Straining to get loose and bust some cobras? Outnumbered, outweighed, but not outhearted. That's when Maniac felt it. Pride for this East End warrior whom Maniac could feel trembling in his arms, scared as Aaron any normal kid would be, but not showing it to them. Yeah, you're bad, all right, Mars Bar. You're more than bad. You're good. Maniac stopped. He had been walking in circles. It was dark. He turned one way, then another, for the briefest moment, thinking to go home. Thinking. It's time to go home now. Then remembering that, once again, he had no home to go to.